Good morning, church, and welcome to our service for Sunday, the 3rd of May. Let's begin, as we always do, in a time of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for our time here this morning. And Lord, we ask that as we gather on our computers, on our tablets and our phones, help us to focus on you. Lord, I pray that you can be with us in this time and remind us that you neither leave us nor forsake us, that your church is called to praise you. And that's exactly what we're doing here this morning. So Lord, help us to do that. And I pray that this morning's service can glorify you and remind us about why we should be praising you, because you are good and you are worthy to be praised. Amen. So with our notices for today, there's just two I want to quickly run you through. Uh, the first one is about our Bible study, which is happening this coming Thursday. Um, as I mentioned last week, we'll be doing this via Zoom. Now, I've sent everyone an email that that's normally comes and meets together here in the church with the Zoom details and, and how to get onto it and, and all that sort of stuff. However, if you're watching this and you'd like to connect with us um, via Zoom, you'd like to join us in a Bible study, please do let me know. I can send you the details as well, including the link and also the password as well. But for this study, we'll be continuing to look at the Gospel of John. We're starting in chapters 11. We're going to be reading from verses 1 to 24. Now, if you haven't been to a Bible study with us, they're fairly informal. When I say informal, it's obviously we come, we read the text, and then we sit around and we discuss it. We talk about things that, that, that come to mind as we're reading it. We discuss questions. Uh, and the idea is that we really let the text dictate the conversation and the flow. Now, sometimes we end up jumping around in scriptures as we look at one thing and we see the cross-reference into another one, um, but that's part of the joy, I think. And, and in doing so, you can see exactly that all scripture is inspired by God, and you can see how it's all interwoven together. So again, that's happening starting this Thursday, the 7th of May. If you're a regular attendee of the church, check your emails. Uh, and if you're listening to this and you haven't got an email from me and you'd like to join us, please do let me know. The second thing I want to talk to you about is our containers for change. So like a lot of churches, we've been asking people to collect um, empty bottles and, and so forth so that we can then trade them in and get a bit of cash to help with the church. Um, this is still happening. Uh, Melinda is still collecting uh, containers and, and whatnot. Um, in fact, last week, a couple of people came and they dropped some off as well. So if you've got some lying around at home, if you've got a bag or you've got something and you're thinking, gee, I need to give this to the church, please let me know or, or ring Melinda as well and she can organize the time where you can drop them off because the hope is that we'll be able to drop them off soon and then obviously have those funds uh, continue to trickle into the church. Let's continue now in communion. And as we gather around the Lord's table this morning, I want to remind you that what we're about to do won't save us. We do this to remember what did save us, and that was the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Remember, he bore the wrath of God on our behalf, the wrath of the Father that we deserve for our sins. And so with this, I ask that if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, that is, you haven't repented and placed your trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, I ask that you don't partake, because Scripture is clear in this, that this is for those who are believers. Now, please don't get discouraged by this. I just would like you to know what it says in the Bible, and we want to affirm that. So I'd like you to continue to watch us. Please uh, take note of what's happening here. If you have any questions, please do let us know. As we come to the Lord's table, I want to remind you that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly his, his reason and his mission here on earth. And we see that particularly right up to the days leading up to his, his death on that cross. And I want to draw your attention to Scripture starting in John chapter 14. And here he's comforting his disciples. He's saying, look, I'm going to go, but I've got to go for a reason. And this is what I want to read to you. So I'm going to read starting in, in verse 1 of John chapter 14. This is what it says. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, I know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, there's so many things that we could talk about in this scripture, but in, in reading this, I want to affirm to you that Jesus is preparing a place for us, that heaven is indeed real. That even though we're living in this, this current moment, we have an expectation that we can look to the, the return of Jesus Christ. And when he returns, he will call his own to his side. We have been redeemed not with perishable things or, or things that can be corrupted. We have been redeemed by his blood. In fact, I want to read to you one more scripture from First Peter that reminds us of that, that the, our hope isn't in things of this world, but in things far more valuable and far more strong. In First Peter 3, this is what it says. In First Peter 3, chapter 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So as we come and we draw to the Lord's table, I want us to look forward to heaven. I want us to look forward to the time when Jesus returns, knowing that we can have hope, knowing that when he returns, it is and he calls us to his side. It is based on his goodness and what he's done for us. So with that wonderful reminder in mind, I want to read to you the words from the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 11, he reminded his readers about what communion means and what it represents. And then he gives everyone a stern warning in the way in which it should be received. This is reading from 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verses 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so that he may eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pause for a moment of repentance, bringing to the Lord any unconfessed sins, as we recognize what we're about to do. Lord, as we examine ourselves, we see that it was our sin that nailed your son to that wretched cross. Please forgive us for being callous with this act. Help us as we bring any unconfessed sins to you and remind us to approach your table with reverence and awe, knowing what we're doing and what it means and what we celebrate as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, we read in Matthew 26, verse 26, the following. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Lord, we thank you for this reminder of your body, the body that was whipped and beaten and broken and nailed to that cross in our place. Lord Jesus, you were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. And by your stripes we are healed. Amen. Let's now eat together as a, as a family. In the same passage in Matthew's Gospel, we read from verse 27, Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my body of the new covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the many of the remission of sins. Lord, we thank you for the reminder of the cost of our salvation, the spilled blood of your sinless Son. May we never take for granted your amazing grace. In verse 29, But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Friends, these verses remind us to look forward to when the Lord returns. Let me read that verse 29 again. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. This is our celebration this morning. Let's all drink together and be, be reminded about the cost that it took for this.
Lord, please grant us joy and hope, knowing that one day when you call us home, that we can call to your side based on what you've done for us. Remind us in our times when we look around and we think, where are you, Lord? Remind us that we have been redeemed and we have an inheritance that is not being able to be corrupted, that can't be stained or marred by this world. So, Lord, please give us joy until you return and a longing expectation when you do, knowing that by faith we've been saved. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, we ask this. Amen. Now, would you please open with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1 for our sermon this morning. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them, and they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were still there, and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning that, that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easy to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose, took up his bed, and went out of the presence of them all, so that they were amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we ask this morning that as we're understanding it, we need your help. Holy Spirit, please give us wisdom. Give me guidance as I'm preaching, and open our hearts and open our minds, Lord, to your truth. We ask this for the sake of Jesus' name. Amen. So next week, I'm going to be starting a new book series, uh, a new preaching series on, on a book, I should say. But this week, I wanted to continue with what's, with what's essentially part two of what we looked at last week. You'll recall last week, we looked at the story of Jesus cleansing um, the leper. And obviously, the truth that he didn't have to touch the man, but he did. He showed amazing mercy and compassion. You'll recall that we looked at the leper, and that was, a, that was really an analogy for our state as sinners, that we are unholy, that we can't stand in the presence of God, that we can't save ourselves. And yet this man came to Jesus and, and he appealed to his mercy and said, um, you can cleanse me if you're willing. And you recall that Jesus said, of course, that I am willing, be cleansed. Well, this next miracle that we see happened a few days later and it, and it shows to us again the power of Jesus. It points to the truth that he not only has authority to talk about scripture, but that he is God. And this comes from three different accounts. So I'm going to be preaching mainly from Mark's account in Mark chapter 2, but it's also, also in Matthew 9 and also Luke 5. And again, as you read all three accounts, you read them, you put them side by side, you get a, a nice full picture of exactly what occurred on this account. And so with this, I need to be, be as direct as I possibly can. This story tells us that Jesus is God. It tells us beyond the shadow of a doubt that he has authority to forgive sin because he is the one whom we sin against. He is God. He heals the man of paralysis, which is amazing in and of itself. But as we see, he does that to prove the first deed he did, that he has the authority, which means the right and the power, as it says in this version, to forgive sins. And so this is our call this morning to be reminded by that. This is the truth that we need to be proclaiming and be reminded of. So let's have a look. In verse 1, it says, a simple context, it simply says, and a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Now, a few days later, after what? Well, at the end of Mark's gospel in chapter 1, it talks about him cleansing the leper. So this has happened a few days after that's occurred. He's in Capernaum, 
And this is a city found on the northeastern part of um, the Sea of Galilee. And really, this was the center of Jesus' ministry in Galilee after he was rejected in his hometown. This was a place where many miracles occurred. This is where his reputation grew as someone that was worth watching and worth following. This is also the place where he called many of his followers. You remember the fisherman Simon later called Peter. He called Andrew. He called James and John. And later, as you read in the next part of this text, this is where he called Levi, later be called Matthew. And this is a really, a really powerful moment in the sense that it's a reminder for us that Jesus called regular people. He called sinners like you and like me to be his followers and to fulfill his, his ministry and to fulfill his purpose for us and, and for them, I should say. But it says in the text that he came home. Now, you may recall previously, as Jesus is talking to his people, he says the words, I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 8. He says, Foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. So this wasn't necessarily a home that Jesus owned, but most Bible scholars state that this was simply Peter's home. This is where Peter, uh, his, Peter's mother-in-law sorry, was healed by Jesus some time ago, and this is really like the base of his operations um, while he was working and, and living in Capernaum. It says, They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Now, of course, as his fame grew, the people came to him. As his miracles and his notoriety came and his word, remember he just finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount. We talked about that last week. That was what he did before he did the cleansing of the leper and now the healing of the paralytic. So they'd heard about him. They'd heard that he speaks with such authority and they thought, hey, I, I want to listen to that guy. I want to hear more of what he has to say. So they came to the house where he was staying. These people weren't just the ordinary people. These were also the, the authority at the time, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, the ones that knew what the, the law said, the ones that the people normally came to for teaching and understanding. And suddenly there's this, there's this person on the scene who's making all these claims that's in their mind supposedly healing people, so they've come to investigate it. They've come to see what's occurring. It says in Luke's account in, in chapter 5, 17, on one day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. Again, so you get this sense that there are people from all over the place, including those Pharisees and those teachers of the law. They were there to verify who this Jesus was and the claims that he was making and the miracles that he was doing. They did the same with, with John the Baptist. You recall when he was baptizing people and, and, and calling out the fact they needed to repent and making a way for the Messiah, they came and they investigated this to find out what all the scuttlebuck was about, what all the gossip and what the word was about. They came to see directly who this person was. And so this is what they're doing with Jesus. And I love this because Jesus didn't waste an opportunity. It says that he taught them the word. He saw the people coming to him and the more people came, the more people came. He didn't stop. It says that he taught them the word. You know, one of the hallmarks of a good teacher is the fact that they don't waste an opportunity. If you've ever been in a class with kids or indeed if you've got little kids, you know that sometimes that they can go off track and lots of things happen. But sometimes when that it occurs or, or unexpected things happen, that's a great teachable moment. And this is something that was occurring, that more people were coming and Jesus used this opportunity to teach. He teach them the word. He taught them the word. Now, there was no doubt in my mind, and others agree, what he was teaching them. The same thing that he's been teaching about his ministry, about the call to repentance, about salvation, about the kingdom of heaven, all those things that he spoke on the Sermon on the Mount. People need reiterating. You can't just hear it once. You've got to hear it again and again. And I guarantee that he would have been saying these things again because this was his call. He was calling to preach about things of eternal nature, things that matter. And so this is what he was doing. As the people were coming to him, he was teaching them the word. He wasn't giving them what they wanted to hear. He was teaching what was on his uh, mission or part of his calling to teach as the son of God, as God in the flesh. So let's have a look at verse 2. And it's interesting that the Pharisees picked a good day to come, didn't they? Of all days for him to come, they picked the day when four random guys would drop a fifth guy through the roof and that Jesus would then use that opportunity to demonstrate his power. 
it says that the people came. And as, as you can imagine in verse 2, that everyone was coming to hear the, hear the Lord. I was reminded about the passage that, that it talks about where Jesus says to his followers, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. One of the greatest lies that Satan tells us is the fact that people don't want to hear the gospel. They don't need the gospel. They would rather not care about it. But it says here that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So we shouldn't believe the lie that people don't want to hear. We shouldn't believe the lie that the gospel isn't for everybody. Because this, in, in this text here, we see people coming to Jesus to hear about it. In other texts, we see the need that people have for the good news. So don't be discouraged. Read this and be encouraged. That just like back then, that today people need to hear the word, the word preached, the word about the kingdom of heaven. And so with this setting in mind, let's look at verse 3 and 4. And it says, Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Now let's think about this for a moment. There was four friends, and there was a fifth guy obviously on a mat. And we're not told why. We're not told why this, this man was paralyzed how long he'd been in that condition, how, whether he was known by the people or not. It just simply says that he was paralyzed, he had four friends, one could argue four very good friends, and they knew, those four friends knew, that they had to get this man to Jesus. They had to make sure that this man came to Jesus because they knew that Jesus alone could help this man. We know that they were determined because they didn't give up after the first obstacle. Just try and imagine the effort to carry this guy. We're not sure how far he came. I think in our minds we kind of think that he was like the next door neighbor, that, he, that, that that's where this guy lived. But the reality is he probably would have had to come from a long way. So these four fellows carried this bloke and got him there a long way. Got him there because they knew that Jesus alone was the one that could help this man. They had faith that Jesus was who he claimed to be and could help their friend. Now, we don't have any names for these four people. They're just simply called four friends. But somewhere along the line, through, through church history, what have you, someone gave them these, the following nicknames. Listen to this. The names are sympathy, cooperation, originality, and persistence. Isn't that great? Sympathy, cooperation, originality, and persistence. And that explains their demeanor or who they were to bring this friend to Jesus. They didn't give up. They got to the house and there was people everywhere. They couldn't get this man to see Jesus, but they didn't give up. You recall their name, sympathy, because they knew that their friend was hopeless without Jesus. Cooperation, it would have been a massive effort to get him there. They would have had to work as a team, working out how to get him to at least the house, let alone through the roof. Originality, well, I don't need to explain that. There's a reason why we're talking about this 2,000 years later. They lowered him through the roof. Well, how good is that? And then persistence. They didn't give up. They saw the problem and they thought, I still need to get our friend to Jesus. What else can we do? And that says that they went through the roof. And of course, originality is an understatement as we think about this. You know, recently I had some security lights installed in my home and, and part of that meant that the electrician had to go on my roof, he had to pull some sheeting off the roof to, to get the wires and run them across from one point to another. And man, it made a noise, it made a racket, there was the bang of the ladder, there was bang, bang, bang on the roof, there was lifting off the sheets, they were talking to each other, they were having a good laugh. And I knew this was occurring and it was such a loud racket. So I knew what was occurring, but even it was a shock to me how loud it was. Now try and imagine being in the room as the fellows are up on the roof there, making their way, digging through the roof, digging, making all sorts of noise. You probably hear them talking about how they're going to get this person down there. You know, I knew what was occurring, but imagine the people in the room with Jesus. Jesus is teaching and this, this commotion is going on above them. I would have loved to have been in that room at the time. I would have loved to have seen exactly the look on people's faces, let alone the bloke who's sitting there on the mat with his four friends going, how on earth am I going to get in there in in luke's account in chapter 5 verse 19 we get a bit more detail it says that when they could not find a way to him what to do this because of the crowd they went up on the roof and they lowered him on his mat 
through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. They took the man exactly where he needed to be most, right at the foot of his saviour, right in the presence of Jesus, knowing that he alone could save them. That's where every single person needs to be, right at the foot of the saviour. And it says through the roof. Most of us think of the roofs that we have nowadays, but of course back in the first century, things were a little bit different. Apparently, according to um, archaeologists and scholars and the like, the, the first century houses had a flat roof and they had an external staircase leading up to the top of the roof. So the idea was in the cool of the afternoon, people could go up there uh, and, and get rest in, in the cool. And also at night time, it was a particularly hot night, people apparently slept on their roofs up there as well. So that's how you can explain, I guess, them getting him on the roof, but getting him through. Well, this was constructed in a different way. Obviously, there was no steel supports. So there was no thick tiles like we have today. But they were clay. It was clay that was made. There was wet clay that was laid over like a layer. There was stronger sort of firm clay that was made out into tiles and put on top of that. So it was firm enough to keep all the elements out. But with a bit of effort, one could dig through and remove the tiles and kind of create an opening great enough. The point is they got the man there they saw what occurred, they had to keep going, and they used effort because they knew that Jesus could, could save their friend. Do you see why they have the nicknames of sympathy, cooperation, originality, and persistence? They didn't give up. They got him up there, now they had to lower him down gently. And it wasn't just a little hole. You know, They didn't make a hole this big to shout to Jesus, hey, help! No, he had to be big enough to lower a whole man on a mat all the way down. It's interesting you think about this and, and I know that one of the ways that Satan likes to interrupt our plans is by simply putting things in our way if we set in our mind that we're going to tell someone about Jesus. We're going to do something that glorifies God. These, these little stumbling blocks with the hope, I imagine, the hope that we're going to see it and be discouraged. This, these men, they saw that there was an issue or saw something in front of them. They didn't. They thought about it and they used their persistence because they knew that it was worth it. They knew it was worth it because of their faith. And we see that in verse 5. Jesus saw their faith and he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven you. So Jesus saw their faith, but he looked to the man. Now it's interesting. You can look at this and say, well, it's because of the man's faith that that paralyzed man had his sins forgiven. But that's not what it's saying. There is a well-known saying um, that says this, God has no grandchildren. That's simply saying that for someone to come to God, to be a son of God or a daughter of God, it requires personal faith. Try as I might, my own personal faith won't save my kids. But my faith in God drives me to do things which in the world's eyes might seem silly. It drives me to lead our family in, in Bible reading, to lead our family in, in hymn time so that we can stop after dinner and we can sing hymns together. It, it leads my wife and I to prioritize things like teaching our kids scripture and doing all these things, surrounding them with the Bible, because we know that faith comes by hearing, by hearing the word of God. So our faith in God leads us to do things. It, it, it leads us to do things which are crazy in the eyes of the world, but we shouldn't care because we know the only thing that matters at the end of the day is where we stand with God. And it was the same with these men. Their faith continued and it spurred them along. As we look at this, I want to remind you, again, we shouldn't be giving up. We shouldn't let up on showing others the love of God and, and proclaiming and talking about the truth that salvation comes through him alone. We shouldn't give up on praying for unsaved loved ones or imploring them that they could see the truth that Jesus alone can save. You know, I've been so encouraged recently because I follow a lot of evangelists and a lot of different churches online. And like us, I've had to change the way they do things. And one such group is a Brisbane-based street evangelism group called Operation 513. Uh, get on Facebook uh, and have a look at them because normally they go to crowded places. They started in Brisbane and they've got different groups around. There's some in New Zealand, there's one in the UK. And they go and they share the gospel with people. They talk to people and they say, well, do you think there's a heaven? What happens when you die? How do you think you'll get there? And they go through the gospel presentation. Now, they can't meet in person, but they're starting to go online. They're finding ways to connect with people online. 
There's different platforms that you can use. They're connecting with a program where you can talk to strangers. And when those strangers come up on the screen, they use that as a way to share the gospel. They're being original and they're being persistent. And it's such an encouraging thing. And I, and I love seeing that because even though we can't meet in person, it's not like the Great Commission doesn't stop. The call is to still go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This thing that's occurring in our society would be a great excuse for us to just stop doing what we're doing, stop loving people, and just turn on Netflix and just wait till the whole thing blows over. But we have an opportunity now to bring people hope, real lasting hope and real lasting joy. And this is one thing. If you're watching this, I pretty much guarantee you've got a Facebook. You know, you can use your Facebook. Don't get me wrong, I love pictures of, you know, pets and animals and funny stuff and, and you know, your, your renovations and your flowers and all that sort of thing. But Facebook is a great tool that we can use to, to share, to proclaim and also to, to remind people, hey, there is an eternity, that something happens after death. It doesn't take much to click a button to share a page that from, another, from another ministry and so on. My point is like these people here that came, they saw the crowd, they got the bloke on the roof, they saw the roof, they didn't stop. And neither should we. Because we know that for those that confess their sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive them of their sins and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. They know that just like this paralyzed man here, without any hope, they need to be at the Savior's feet. So let's look at the words of Jesus. He sees a man, remember, he comes down, he looks at the four friends and he says to the man on the mat, your sins are forgiven. Now, how ludicrous is that? Obviously, there's a need this man has, and, and clearly there's a need because he's on this mat. Otherwise, he would have maybe pushed his way through the crowds. The crowd probably knew him. If he was a local person, they would have maybe seen him down the street or what have you. They probably thought, well, why is he forgiving his sins? There's a greater problem here. The truth is that Jesus, of course, knew that this man had a greater issue than his paralysis. Even though he was helpless, even though he couldn't help himself, it was a greater issue. He knew that his sin meant that he would to face the wrath of God, that he needed to be forgiven and he needed to be given a pardon. He needed to be forgiven for that sin. Jesus knew that the sin which leads to death is far more dangerous than paralysis or something to do with the body. And I was thinking about this because this is about a priority. Someone may see a need and feel like their need is greater, but the greatest need, of course, is about eternity. And I remember this. When I was in a car accident back in 2005, when I was in year 12, I was bush bashing with my brother, didn't have a seatbelt on. It's, it's a long story, but essentially I, I proved the, physical, the, the physics term of inertia. I hit the tree, the car stopped, and I didn't. I just kept going. I cracked my head on the windscreen. I broke my femur on the steering wheel. And I mean, I mean, I broke it in two. It was disastrous. Anyway, I'm sitting there in the car in the middle of this field in Beanley, in this big 100 plus acre property. My uncle's with me. My brother's with me. It's actually the same uncle that comes from Russell Island. Um, most of you know him because he comes to the church and looks at me and he knows that I've got to get out of that car. I look at him. I remember asking for water. I said, because I was thirsty. I was in shock. I had blood coming down my head. And my immediate need, I was thirsty. And he just said to me, no, we need to get you out of this car first. Then we'll worry about water. And that's exactly what he did. He found some help and he got some help. And I got taken out of the car and put in the back of another car. And then I was given water. I remember thinking, well, I'm, I'm thirsty now. But he knew that there was a greater need. And that was getting me out of this car and into somewhere safe. Because that tree, beyond that tree was a ravine and it was very unstable where we were. So even though it may look like this man had a great need, Jesus knew that his greater need was something about his sins and the fact that his sins had to be forgiven. And so this is what we need to think about as well. And then we see a reaction from verse 6. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, you know that they are teachers of the law. They knew the law. They were the ones whom the people came to. They were the experts, and they knew what the Old Testament scriptures said. They knew scriptures such as this in Isaiah 43, 25. This is the Lord of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob speaking. Yahweh, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions 
for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. They would have known scriptures such as in Daniel chapter 9, verse 9. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. They would have known that to sin means to sin against God. Therefore, God alone had the authority and the right to forgive those sins. And it's interesting. It's, it's like the difference between knowledge and then wisdom because they knew that truth, but they failed to see the, the application of it. It's like an old saying, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. So it's the same thing here. They, they knew that God alone could forgive sins, and that's 100% correct. And yet they failed to see that in making this claim and everything that occurred, that Jesus was pointing to the fact that he is God. Let's have a look at the next verse. I'll read again from verse 6. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Notice that they thought it in their hearts, which is like a way to say they thought about it. So they're thinking it in their mind, and Jesus perceived it in his spirit. The all-knowing God of the universe knew what they were thinking, and so he called them out. They didn't say this out loud. There was no sort of body language necessarily that, that gave away what they were thinking. It says that they were thinking it, and Jesus perceived it. He knew what they were thinking. So right there, he proved his power again. But they missed that point. In verse 9, he says, Jesus says this, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. What he's saying here is it's easier to claim that someone has forgiving forgiveness of sins because to say that, there's no physical evidence. You can't actually see that occurring. Whereas if you claim that someone's healed, particularly of a physical uh, ailment, you see evidence straight away. This is part of the reason why a lot of the, 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 the charlatans and the, the snake oil salesmen that claim to be false healers, they only want people that come up with ailments in which you can't see. Whereas get a real person with a real disability, they kind of unfortunately shun them away. And, and this isn't really a topic of discussion, but it's the same point, isn't it? That in this, if someone is claiming to have forgiven sins, well, anybody can do that. But to say to a paralyzed man, hey, get up, get your mat and go home, well, that requires proof straight away, which you can see. So in commanding the paralytic man, it requires something to happen immediately. So in healing the man, Jesus was showing, of course, that what he said previously was also true. He says in verse 10, But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, Take your mat and go home. He referred to himself there as the Son of Man. In Mark's Gospel, it says it over 14 times, and this is a messianic title. So in this thing, he's saying that I'm the Messiah, I'm the long-awaited one, the one that all the scriptures point to. And in in doing so, he's saying, not only am I Messiah, but I am God. Here was the proof. He said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. It's interesting, imagine being the man on the mat. What's he going to do? Because it doesn't say that he waited a little bit. It says that he happened immediately. One commentary I read said this was a, an obedience thing. It was a call to faith and then a call to obedience. He had to have faith that Jesus was who he said he was, and then he had to be obedient in what Jesus had done, in actually getting off his backside, grabbing his mat, and then going home. Because it says that in verse 12, he got up, he took his mat, And he walked out in full view of them all. Jesus proved that what he did was true because we are reading, this is an eyewitness account. In Luke's account, it says that it happened immediately. Again, just like the cleansing of a leper, it was a miracle because it happened straight away. You know, it didn't take weeks and weeks of rehab. It didn't take a slow, long time. No, it said that when Jesus spoke it immediately, the man was healed. And this is even more amazing if you consider it because when I broke my leg in that car accident, I, of course, had to have an operation. I had some metal put into my leg. I couldn't use my leg for six weeks. And when I finally started to use my leg, it took a long time to get the strength back. 
It's amazing. In only six weeks, I lost a lot of muscle tone. It was very weak. It was very hard to walk on initially. So I had to be gently, gently, softly, softly. We don't know how long this man was paralyzed, but yet it says in the scripture that immediately he got up. Immediately there was power, that the muscles and the sinews and the bones worked together. This is the power of our creator God that created the man, can heal the man. And this healing was immediate. He responded the man in faith and obedience. We talk a lot about faith here, and Jesus said that the faith of the man brought him to Jesus. And it was this man's personal faith that what Jesus had said had come to pass. In Luke's account, again, immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he'd been lying on, and he went home praising God. This man went home praising the God who forgave his sins and the God that healed him. Again, it has to be said that Jesus is God, that he is the second member of the Trinity, he is the Son of God, and and the way we understand it is that he is God. Unfortunately, a lot of people claim to know Jesus, but they don't know the biblical Jesus. A lot of people claim that Jesus was a good person or a good teacher, and and you, you talk to people and you know they love talking about that Jesus, but as soon as you start saying, well, Jesus is God, that he is the creator, he is the only way to salvation, people start to back away. The reality is if you deny the deity of Jesus, the deity of Christ, that he is God, then you're not a Christian because that is a key part of our faith. It is a key truth found in the Bible again and again. If you don't believe me, read John's Gospel. Let's look at the end of verse 12. So we have this amazing miracle occur. And it says in in the second part of verse 12, this amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amazing is indeed true. Again, this is a miracle. Miracles remind people of the power of God. They point people to the source of that power. Remember all all the miracles the apostles did. They weren't given power so that they could exalt themselves they were given power so they could point and say hey this doesn't come from me this comes from the lord jesus whom you crucified i was reading acts chapter 2 this morning and that's part of what peter talks about this jesus whom you crucified he was saying that this is god so all these miracles that occurred they were for a reason they weren't to sort of validate anything except for the fact that jesus was who he said he was and claimed to be So the call has to be, as as we look at this text, and there's so much that we can get from this. Last week we talked about that the leprosy represents the sin and our uncleanliness before God. This text here, as we look at the man who was on the mat, who was helpless, this is another example of our sin, that in our own sin we are helpless. We can't help ourselves. We have no way to do anything for ourselves. And this is a picture of helplessness that we must realize before we come to the Savior's feet. So since Jesus is God, if you're still on that mat, if like that man you're still in your sins, knowing that if you die you'd face the wrath of God as a perfect holy judge, please come to Jesus. Come to his feet. Know that you are helpless like that man on the mat. Have faith that what he says he will do he will do and what he says he has done it is true know that in by repenting and placing your trust in his work on that cross that you can gain forgiveness of sins that you can gain everlasting life and just like that man it happens immediately this cleansing isn't a gradual thing this pardon for your sin isn't a gradual thing jesus took the punishment that you and i deserve therefore when anyone comes when they repent when they call out to jesus Just like that man on the mat, it happens immediately. They're pardoned immediately. Justice was served on the cross so that you don't have to bear the weight of your sin. And and as you do this, knowing immediately that Jesus has cleansed you, then you can be like this man, that you can rejoice, knowing that you have been saved. You can praise God, knowing that you've been saved. And let's look at these four friends and be encouraged. Remember, we gave them a nickname of sympathy, cooperation, originality, and persistence. As as fellow Christians, we can be like these four friends. We have a, a, a knowledge and we have a truth that we need to proclaim to the world. 
And we can do it in many and varied ways. And, and the way we do it may change, but what we say should never change. That Jesus is God and he has the authority and the power and the right to forgive people of their sins. We need to do what we can, pray for wisdom, pray for an, an honest earning so that we can look to others and, and we can give some ways in which we can bring them to the Lord in the sense of bringing them the truth. And I know a lot of us here have loved ones that we pray for and loved ones that are down south and, and further north, whether it be you know, kids or grandkids or extended family members. I think one of the most powerful ways that we can pray is they get surrounded by people like these four men. That They get surrounded by people that know the truth and that are original and that are resilient, that are sympathetic and they are persistent. We shouldn't underestimate the power of prayer. We may not be able to be there physically but we can be praying for our loved ones we can be praying that their eyes can be open that they can have friends around them to bring them in their helpless state to the feet of the savior and so that in doing so they can praise god knowing that their sins are forgiven and their greatest problem has been taken care of let's pray together now lord as we reflect on our state without you we know that we are helpless we are just like that man on the mat who is paralyzed. We're paralyzed in our own sin, knowing that if we were to die in this state, that we face justice for what we've done, for violating your laws, for forgetting our Creator. Lord, we pray for those that don't know this, that you can open their eyes, help them to be at the foot of your Son, to look to the cross as not only just something that one wears around a neck, but as a symbol of hope and a symbol of truth, that because of that sacrifice, that the justice has been served, that Jesus is God. Lord, please give us encouragement. Help us to be like those four friends that have showed originality and persistence, showed sympathy, and showed the fact that they wanted to bring others to the knowledge of you. As a church and as a body, Lord, please give us uh, wisdom to help others, Give us persistent and remind us that we can be praying for our loved ones. And Lord, we ask as we're praying, we ask for your mercy to reveal to them your wonderful truth. And so we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining me here this morning. Uh, I pray that you have a blessed week and look forward to connecting with you next time. All right, take care. God bless.